Well, good afternoon, everybody. We are going to get started, and we want to thank uh, all of our attendees for being here. Uh, we appreciate your attendance and, and uh, certainly look forward to your questions uh, throughout this as well so that we can have some uh, engagement with what, what truly is a wonderful panel. Um, so we're going to get started. I have the privilege of serving uh, as the uh, moderator MC today. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Roach, and I serve as the Senior Vice President of the National Healthcare Practice for Core Education, uh, which has the privilege of working uh, with Greensboro College in the wonderful work that they do, uh, not just in North Carolina, but throughout the nation with the thousands of alumni that they have. And so, uh, again, we thank you for being here. I do want to acknowledge uh, all of our panelists and then uh, ask Dr. Zarda to make some brief uh, opening remarks. And so we are joined today, uh, as I mentioned, by an esteemed panel of, of true experts, uh, not just in their field, um, but also in this very topic that we will speak about today. Uh, first and foremost, we are joined by Dr. Uh, Lawrence Zarda, president of Greensboro College, uh, who I will add has served uh, more than most tenures of college presidents, which speaks to not just the impact the success and frankly, the results that he's having as a college president. Um, and you will hear from him very shortly. We are also joined by Michelle. Um, and, and I apologize, Michelle, in advance if I mispronounce your last name, but I'm going to try. Uh, Adam Alakin is how I will say. And you correct me uh, when you join us uh, if I am wrong. Michelle serves as the executive vice president and the chief people and culture officer at Cone Health. And we know that uh, Michelle is a, a leader that is very much at the forefront of setting apart Cone Health in this nation, uh, where recently we saw Cone Health specifically called out as one of the top 15 healthcare systems in the country. Um, and so Michelle will, I'm sure, speak about what is unique and special uh, about Cone Health. And then finally, we are joined uh, by Rafael Castaneda, uh, who serves as the Vice President of Workforce Development at MedCerts. Um, and he will speak to us at a national level about what MedCerts is seeing uh, as well. Before I move over to Dr. Zarda, I do want to acknowledge and thank uh, members of the Greensboro College team, uh, as well as other members of the team that have put this together. Um, and so, you know, just want to acknowledge uh, Lauren, Andrew, Joe, uh, Pam, and, and many others that have been a part of, of putting this together, as well as the work that they do each and every day in support of, of Greensboro College, as well as Suzanne, um, who serves as the Director of the Workforce and, and uh, Innovation and Workforce Development uh, program at Greensboro College. Each and every one of them do the work that supports not just the region, uh, but also the community. And so, Dr. Zard, I'd like to welcome you to, to make some brief remarks, and, and we will get started. Uh, thank you, Jeffrey. Um, and while Jeffrey has introduced me, I will say that at most formal events, I introduce myself this way. I say I'm Dr. Lawrence Zarda, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as the 18th president of Greensboro College in our 184th year. And I mention that because we do what we do very well. We've been doing it a very long time. We are a traditional, small, private liberal arts college right in downtown Greensboro. That's who we are, and that's what we do. But I'm going to talk in just a minute about something that is really um, a new commitment for us, uh, addressing workforce development needs. Um, we have long provided people to the workforce, uh, teachers, uh, biology teachers, chemistry teachers, and so on. Uh, we also today have four-year degrees in some of the science, technology, engineering, and math, or also adding arts in the STEAM, uh, that are healthcare-related. Uh, majors in biology, specifically a biomedical track, exercise science, health science, public health, and more. We're looking at nursing because the demand is so high. All our four-year degrees. Uh, our students come here as traditional undergraduates. They spend their four years on campus. Uh, they are studying in their major. Uh, they may be in the choir or the gospel choir. They may play softball or football, and they're having the, the traditional undergraduate experience. Many these days go on to graduate school in areas such as becoming an MD or a physician's assistant, a physical therapist, uh, occupational therapist, or dentist or others. In fact, here in Greensboro recently, I'm working on a couple orthopedic issues. I've worked with two physical therapists that I handed them their degrees you know, a few years ago. But they need an additional four, uh, two years or three years or four years to get into the workforce in those fields. So recently, there have been many efforts regionally identifying uh, the need for direct and aggressive and timely workforce development. We are hurting in a number of areas. We just don't simply have the pipelines and pathways that we would like. Uh, a few years ago, the Piedmont Triad Talent Alignment Strategy Report that was done by the Piedmont Triad Partnership, I was on the steering committee, identified the needs in about a 20-county area. 
More recently, Governor Cooper launched the My Future NC, uh, which uh, seeks to add 400,000 additional people to the workforce that have what are called high quality post-secondary credentials, associate's degrees, bachelor's degrees, certificates, and so on. And then here more locally, our local component of My Future NC, uh, driven by the Community Foundation of Greater Greensboro is called Guilford Jobs 2030 or GJ30. A little bit different metric, we're trying to raise the proportion of the workforce that has high quality post-secondary credentials from the current 42 to 44% to 60% by the year 2030. I happen to chair that advisory uh, group. Um, Greensboro College, are gonna, we're going to uh, continue to do what we've always done for 184 years. We will continue to offer our four-year degrees, including those in healthcare and related fields. But we saw the need. And as a matter of fact, I maintain that every educational institution needs to meet this need for something different, something that is more direct. So we have launched the Greensboro College Center for Innovation and Workforce Development, and the director is Suzanne Siddharth, who is part of this uh, webinar. Um, in addition, I would say that I have seen the power of not only public-private partnerships, but also academic healthcare partnerships. I've seen that uh, myself in my own career. Uh, for 15 years, I was on the board of a community hospital in the Piedmont area of Northern Virginia, and there were four corporations, the health system, the hospital, long-term care, and the foundation. I chaired all of those boards at some point during my 15 years. And in terms of, there are many hundreds of meetings during that 15 years, but there were probably about 200 full board meetings. And we heard a report every single board meeting for the need for personnel and the need for workforce development. It is chronic, it is with us, and Greensboro College is gonna do our fair share in meeting that need. So Jeffrey, that is why we're here today. That is the commitment that Greensboro College has made. Great, thank you, Dr. Zarda, and thank you for your, uh, not only your commitment, but your transformative leadership uh, to advance not just the region, but also when, when we talk about it, not just the education, but also the health uh, of the region forward. Um, Michelle, I'm gonna come to you, but before I do, I wanna share uh, a recent, uh, some, some text out of a recent Forbes article that I think in many ways speaks to uh, not just this topic, but what we're truly facing uh, in healthcare. And I'll ask that you react to that and then also make any opening uh, comments that you would like, and then I'll certainly ask Raphael to do so as well. Um, this Forbes article, which was just published back at the end of May, specifically highlighted that, that there are some reports at the national level that suggest that in healthcare, uh, over the last year, two years, and even several months, we have lost an estimated 20% uh, of our healthcare workforce. And, and those same reports uh, argue that we've lost roughly 30% of our nurses. Uh, at a time when we know in many regions, many healthcare systems, a lot of our nurses are actually getting close to retirement. Uh, and I say that as the son of a nurse who's who my own mother recently uh, retired after 30 years uh, of nursing. It also specifically said though, that um, this year alone, we saw 1.7 million people quit their healthcare jobs. Uh, and that is directly according to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. And that is the equivalent to almost 3% of the healthcare workforce each month. Significant issue, uh, curious to hear your thoughts, Michelle, and, and specifically, where do you see opportunities where Greensboro College, MedCerts, et cetera, can be a part of the solution? Thanks, Jeffrey, for having me today to, you know, really start to um, put forward this conversation. That article truly puts um, in context what we've been facing um, within the healthcare industry. Prior to COVID-19, um, the industry as a whole was already facing a, um, what I would call a talent shortage. And um, the pandemic, of course, as everyone knows, truly exacerbated that problem. Um, you know, it, it created what we were now calling the great resignation. Um, it's not only impacted healthcare, um, it's also impacted other industries. However, again, the challenge has been heightened locally, nationally, and regionally for the healthcare industry because of the previous talent shortage that we were involved in. We are, you know, here locally at Cone. Um, in our community and nationally, we're, we're currently operating in what I would call a hyper-competitive environment. We are truly in a war for talent. You touched on it in that article, right? One in five healthcare workers quit their jobs. 31% um, are, are considering moving to a new job. Um, employment in healthcare is down nationally. 
um, by uh, close to you know, 550,000 um, workers. Um, about 16% of hospitals are facing critical staffing shortages. By 2030, the World Health Organization expects a net shortage of 15 million healthcare workers across the global healthcare industry. The healthcare occupations are projected to grow 16% from 2020 to 2030, adding approximately, I would say, 2.6 million new jobs. And that growth is mainly due to our aging population, um, leading to greater demand for healthcare services. So like other healthcare systems, Cone Health has a growing need from my perspective for um, you know, healthcare workers. So for example, we have a significant need for medical assistance. The current supply of graduates is not matching our demand. And so um, we really need that support. So here at Cone, from where I sit, um, the future of healthcare is really dependent on you know, us finding solutions to the labor shortage. It's clear um, that poaching each other's frontline talent uh, and throwing dollars at it um, with sign-on bonuses um, is not a feasible long-term solution. So the first reality is, is that we recognize that there just aren't enough people to fill the needs for not just our, our roles globally, but regionally and locally. Um, the second reality is every time we fill a vacant position with a higher priced external talent, you lose some of the lived experiences, right? The institutional knowledge of someone who's worked with our organization and has truly bought into our culture, which often translates into what? Decreased patient satisfaction for us. Um, clinical outcome metrics, um, you know, we see a decrease in what those are, are looking at and trending at. So here at Cone, we are on a journey um, from success to significance, and that's um, based on our very robust um, and strategic imperatives. And so we're focused on both operational and strategic workforce planning strategies. Operationally, for example, we're focused on our employee value proposition. We're focused on our culture and we're, we're kicking off a cultural assessment. We're focused on our engagement and our retention, of course. And, and we're really looking to implement new and innovative care models and expand some of our premium labor pools. Strategically, um, we're focused on a, what I call a buy, lease, build model. Um, our buy strategy is focused on creating more innovative sourcing strategies to attract and recruit the best talent. So that's going to be an ongoing situation where we are constantly looking to recruit permanent employees into the organization. Our lease strategy is focused on our need to make sure that we leverage a defined percentage of contingent workforce to balance the ebbs and flows of our industry relative to volumes and acuity, for example. Our third, um, and I would say our most important strategy is our build strategy. That's truly, Jeffrey, about growing our own talent because we recognize that the talent shortage has accelerated a massive and possibly irreversible trend. We've got you know, workers um, with a new sense of mobility um, that they've never seen before. And as a result, to hire and keep good employees, we understand we need to offer good jobs, with opportunities for growth and promotion. So as the chief people and culture officer for Cone Health, I understand that investing in our people will always provide good return. Um, and this rings especially true in our healthcare industry. I'm a firm believer that if you wanna grow, um, if you want one year of prosper prosperity, you grow grain. If you want 10 years of prosperity, you grow trees. But if you want 100 years of prosperity, you grow people. Um, I believe that by investing in our people, we tap into one of our competitive advantages here at Cone Health to improve our patient care, enhance employee engagement, and boost our overall brand and reputation. The return on our investment can be extremely significant from where I sit, given our current reality. So here at Cone, our mindset is to be intentional, it's to think long term around how we're going to help to create the capacity that we need to develop, retain our top talent, 
and the ROI is absolutely significant. So we're continuing our focus on expanding and creating new career pathways here at Cone and Pipelines internally to upskill our talent for upward mobility, which drives retention, whether it's in the nursing realm or the nursing tech space, certified medical assistants, phlebotomists, you name it. Um, we also recognize we can't do it alone. So I'm excited around our partnership with organizations and institutions like Greensboro College um, that we'll be able to work with um, as from a partnership perspective to increase our pipeline into these career pathways um, and pipeline opportunities to really ensure that we are able to meet the needs of the communities we serve. Great, thank you, Michelle. And it's a perfect segue uh, what I heard you say is, is that when eds and meds, education and medicine, healthcare come together, uh, we can truly solve some of the most societal issues that we're facing. Uh, Raphael, at a national level, uh, MedCerts has been working on this for quite some time, but I know, uh, you know some of this work has only grown further uh, during the pandemic and as a result of the great resignation. Talk to us about, obviously, reflection on what Michelle just shared, um, but any other thoughts that you think would be important to share from a national perspective, given your work? Yeah, um, you know, first, thank you for the the opportunity to participate today and 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 have this conversation because it I, I you know unfortunately wish I could say that this is the first one of these that my team and I have ever had and that's just not the case you know when you hear um, you know folks at Michelle's level um, across major hospital systems or healthcare providers that message is pretty similar unfortunately. Um, it, it, it has been, it is, and it's forecasted to continue in, in this pattern. And so, you know, for MedCerts, uh, you know, the organization has been around since 2009. We, we primarily focus on online training, specifically in healthcare and IT programs. Our goal um, and our mission, as we see it, is to partner with Greensboro College, with Cone Health and, and, and others in those veins and help supplement and complement those strategies that you've just heard just now. Um, the, the frontline role component of our work is that every one of our programs is dedicated to a certification. And in healthcare, we all know that that's an absolute requirement to kind of get into that role. So what we bring to the party is the, the talent, the, the talent pipeline. Um, our parent organization, Stride Learning, is primarily a K-12 entity. And so we have a strategy called K to Job. We believe that a, a, a learner in the United States should be able to go from kindergarten to gainful employment with a very clear pathway that's easily definable and, and doesn't you know, require them to go into massive amounts of debt or take you know, decades to complete and do it in a matter of time that hopefully moves at the speed of business. Because what Michelle just outlined is not going to get any better with concepts. It's only going to get better with real strategies that are tangible, that are that have traction, and that are in existence today. So, you know, from a med search perspective, we we work across the entire the entire nation, and what we've crystallized on is the opportunity to create a a, a pipeline, a, an evergreen pipeline, of talented students coming through our programs that are seeking certification and doing that in partnership with academic institutions and healthcare employers. So that intersection is really where we play. We are not a healthcare system. We are not a 184 year old college. We're, we're a training provider that allows for uh, students, learners to create uh, an opportunity for themselves and their families that's not just today, but is also on an ongoing basis. So I'll just like quickly describe what that looks like. Um, we work with many healthcare employers to uh, not only recruit students into training, but also provide a, a potential opportunity on the back end in the front role for a, a healthcare organization like, like Cone. So the, the mention of medical assistance, every single group that we talk to says medical assistance, phlebotomy tech, surgical technicians, you name it, these are the very you know, high in demand occupations in every corner of our country. So you know, what we do is we actually provide that, that, that pathway for students to not only come and get an education that leads towards certification, and this is not medical assistant according to, to med certs, this is medical assistant according to the NHA. So they always have to move towards that national recognized certification 
that's what healthcare employers need. We then point that pipeline of, uh, of talent towards that healthcare employer, specifically at their locations where they need those. The employer sponsors that training. And, and what I love, Michelle, talking about the, the ability to drive not only recruitment, but also retention of employees long term. And that's really where the relationships with the, with the academic institutions come into play. So, you know, being able to provide a a, a very strong catalog of, of, of training programs that lead short certifications that fill frontline roles today. Great, we can check that, say, yes, we have that, let's go ahead and move to the next, the, the next stage. The, the piece that I think is really transformative and we're seeing a, a lot of traction on is how educational entities like Greensboro College can continue to add significant value to their healthcare employer partners on a go forward basis. So we've actually been able to um, articulate credit for our graduates and not just ACE recommendation credits for a certification, but actual credit for courses taken like AP or med term. So that when a student articulates that as a PLA into a degree, they're not having to retake midterm or AP again, which is really exciting for the learner because then they can say, gosh, I go to a med certs program, I then certify, I go fill a frontline role, the employer potentially pays for that in a sponsored way, and then I get that frontline role helping the employer. But then as I grow in my career and I think, gosh, what are my new opportunities for myself? I can then take that med cert certification and take it to a Greensboro or Franklin or wherever and transfer that into a bachelor's or associate's degree for articulated credit. That then enables them to continue their academic journey into the next stage. So maybe they wanted to be in nursing and they're on a two-year waiting list. So why don't I go ahead and get my MA right now, go work full time, go get a job. And then when I'm ready, transfer that into a degree. And hopefully my employer's got a great tuition assistance policy there to be able to, to, to help pay for that or even offset some of those costs into a degree at a Greensboro College or, or something similar. That pathway and that opportunity for those learners, we're seeing obviously a tremendous level of interest in that. The reason for it, number one, it's great for the learner. Our primary true north, great for the learner. Number two, uh, it's not gonna put them into debt. That's really, really important from a consumer perspective. Um, number three, it's a certified program or certification program. So it's not, again, MedCert's version of this. This is a certification program that's gonna lead towards an actual skill, competency, mastery, something they can take with them no matter where they go, which is really, really important. It's filling frontline roles with the healthcare employer partner, which is obviously very beneficial. We heard about that, uh, that, that, that urgency and that crisis that we're seeing today. But then it allows the learner to continue that academic journey, fill the enrollment uh, numbers for a, uh, a, a college who perhaps maybe is having some contractions in, in those enrollment numbers because the student doesn't know, gosh, do I need to go do that? Or should I go do something else? Do I go to work? What do I do? I don't wanna be the next person to get laid off again. So there's a lot of those questions that I think that we're providing very specific answers to. And so we're just thrilled to be able to participate and supplement and complement the strategies that we've just heard because number one, we believe that they're gonna continue. Uh, number two, this is very beneficial for all parties involved. And number three, this is not conceptual. This is not something that we're planning on doing. This is something that we're doing here today. So what we're trying to do is do our part, like Dr. Sars has said, we're trying to do our part to help solve this. We know we're not going to be able to do it alone. So partnerships is really important for MedCerts because, as I mentioned, we are not a major healthcare system. We are not a 184-year-old college. We fit in as a partner to be able to help that pathway become a reality and hopefully solve some of these problems today and use that as a case study for others to emulate. So thanks for allowing me a few minutes to kind of walk through that. Great. Thank you, Raphael. Um, I want to come back, Michelle, to... Uh, an important element in this dialogue that I think oftentimes can be missed, which is the fact that, um, you know, as you said it, so many of our certified medical assistants who do uh, truly heroic work end up going into being nurses uh, or go in and, and sometimes even become practice administrators. Can you talk about in your career, because I know you have served at some of the best healthcare systems in the nation, where you have seen individuals start in what is considered more of an entry level role, but then further progress. Because I think a lot of times as a former hospital administrator, people don't understand that there's a lot of opportunity. Um, and, and I wanna come to you first on this, and then I wanna ask Dr. Zarda, because it's, it's important as we think about education, how this all comes together. Well, you know, I can speak for myself. I started 
um, in the workforce as a receptionist and have worked my way up, um, you know, across varying roles to where I am today. Um, and, uh, you know, I've seen within um, my career individuals that have started in entry level roles and have been able to um, partner with mentors and um, continue to advance their academics. And what I would say is remain coachable. Um, and, you know, really has been able to um, embrace opportunities that come their way. I, I really uh, I have a, a model in my mind, Jeffrey, around how do you how I define success and what's worked for me. And it, the first piece of that model is preparation. I'm a firm believer that, you know, you want to be prepared for the next piece of the model, which is you know, um, opportunity. There's nothing worse than being prepared and there are no opportunities. And then there's equally nothing worse than opportunities coming your way and you're not prepared. So again, you've got to first and foremost, be prepared, preparation plus the opportunity plus execution, the ability to be able to get into that opportunity and make the best of it and really work to the top of your license or your credential um, to really at least position yourself for success. So I think it is it is critical. It's 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 so important to see individuals like myself and like others on this call that I know started from humble beginnings and have worked your way, not necessarily always going directly up. Sometimes we go across, sometimes we go down to go back up. Um, but ultimately, again, the, the education component is critical. I believe it's the great equalizer, right, for all of us and for and truly a competitive advantage for our, our world, our global world today. So I'm excited um, about the opportunities that MedCerts and Greensboro continue to provide for organizations like Cone Health. Thank you for that, Michelle. Dr. Zarda, um, as you referenced, but, but didn't necessarily go into as much detail, Greensboro College has actually been involved in, in workforce development for quite some time. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, that, that also started under your leadership. Um, and certainly, you know, your, your bringing Suzanne on was a critical uh, moment. But talk to us about why you as a college president uh, have felt so strongly about this. Um, and, and where you see it only continuing to grow. Because as I mentioned, we know you have other programs. Um, and so this isn't just, you're doing it because it's the flavor of the month. You're doing this because it's critical, but I also know it's in your DNA. So talk to us a little bit more about that. Uh, Jeffrey, I will. And, and, and here at the college, we also see this initiative, uh, including matters of access and equity. Uh, I'll take a moment to describe what our student body looks like. As some people might misunderstand what a small private college is these days. And I'm speaking just for Greensboro College, but we're not unique. Um, if you look at just our traditional undergraduates, uh, we are about 60% first generation, me, the first in their college, generation in their college, uh, in the family, excuse me, to go to college. Uh, in addition, we're about 55% Pell Grant eligible. So we serve a relatively financially needy uh, population. Um, and we're about 50-50 uh, minority status, non-minority status. That, that's our student body. But... We also know, I know, and the college knows that there are those who are applying to come here uh, and they're just not going to be able to do it, primarily financially, even with the help from the federal government and loans and so on. Um, and Michelle already talked about, you know, kind of getting into the system and then where you go from there. Uh, I'd also share just uh, as Michelle did personally, I'm a first generation American. I'm the first male to ever earn a degree in my family. And I did transform my life. You know, I am now doing what I'm doing. And I envision uh, young men and women, and not necessarily young either, any man or woman, getting into the, the healthcare system through one of these certificates. And who knows where that person will be in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years. Um, I have seen that. And while we will continue to do what we do as a residential small liberal arts college, this initiative allows us to serve a whole new demographic. And that's very important to us and very exciting to us. Um, I would note right now, this is new. I mean, we have just launched this new center. We are not yet able to offer credit for the certificates, but that is something we are looking at. It may not be for all of them, but for those where it makes sense, that is something we will be looking at. Great, thank you, Dr. Zarda. And I do wanna highlight as, as an individual that has been on your campus, 
uh, as I tell people all the time, what I saw was personalized attention uh, from the faculty to the administrators to just the campus feeling. Uh, that's what's unique about Greensboro College. And, and I, I, I know that's also what's unique about Cone Health because Cone Health has been recognized for that as a healthcare provider. So there's something unique in the water uh, or in the environment within that region uh, that, that is special. And, and we want to make sure we highlight that. Uh, Raphael, there, there is always, when we talk about training, uh, and particularly in healthcare, there are always people who, who kind of resort back to, um, you know, how do you do this without quote unquote in person? I want you to speak about um, the rigor, the quality, and the process that MedCerts has gone through. And, and, and even specifically, if you could highlight um, the expertise that you brought into the organization from a practitioner end, so that people get a more a stronger comfort and, and, and uh, level of, of understanding that this isn't just training. This is truly uh, more hands-on than people truly realize. Yeah, I, and I'm, I appreciate you surfacing that because when most people hear training, to your point, they think um, maybe this is a reading in a, in a book and a discussion board with others in the classroom and, and turning in a paper or something along those lines. And, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with those. I think we've all had experiences with that. But for this particular type of uh, discipline or uh, profession, you know, at some point, this has to be practiced on a live human being. And so you, you need to make sure that you're thinking about that end game as you reverse engineer your programs to when a student enters them. So when we define a program at MedCerts, we think of it as multiple courses inside of that program. So to your point about um, you know, uh, stackable credentials or how they lead into other places, how somebody can grow their career through more education. We start everyone off with a professionalism and allied health course. How do you interact with other human beings in this environment? Um, you know, you, you definitely need to learn med term and AP and you got to know where things in the body are. And, you know, if, if that's a something that, that's important in the allied health field or health in general, I think that that's something a student should experience. And then we layer in the actual clinical component where they're going to be moving towards that certification exam. Now, the real magic that we believe, and, and we encourage people to, to dive into our programs, lift the hood, experience what's inside there and bring your subject matter experts with you because we want these stress tested from experts. So how we design programs is based upon our 12 elements of e-learning. Um, we believe in uh, simulation, uh, utilizing technology inside of the platform to be able to get students to experience something in a virtual environment, yes, but you're also required to pass a specific competency to then move to the next level. So it's, it's really building on skills and competencies as you move forward. And the, the technology is designed to assess that in multiple different ways. We utilize the VARC technique, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, et cetera. So the, the important piece of this is a full immersive experience in an online technology then allows the student to also experience lectures from medical assistants from phlebotomy techs. Um, we engage with employers to help design the curriculum. So it's not, our, again, our version of this, but you know, somebody in Michelle's world probably participated in the creation of some of our programs because they know what, it, what it's like in theory. And then they also know what it's like in the application of that theory in a real world setting. So we're very, very proud of our programs. We feel like it trains towards those skills and competencies so that as the student passes that exam, we're then able to engage with our healthcare employer partners and give that on-site experience. Because Cone Health is gonna have their version of how they do things. And so when a new person comes in and gets onboarded, they're gonna to need to experience that in a training or in an onboarding or some kind of experience. Um, the clinical aspects of say like phlebotomy tech, pokes and sticks, right? We wanna make sure that the student has that experience in a real life setting after their uh, didactic training portion. So it is kind of a combination. We would not consider it a hybrid because that piece is not required to actually go take the certification exam, but we do work very, very closely with our healthcare employer partners to provide those experiences, those clinical externship experiences. So that as a student goes from theory in an immersive setting, they then take that to the real world where you have a person who's there who has expectations of the least amount of pain as possible. Um, and if you've ever gotten a shot before, you know that you're voting for that to happen the first time and one time only. <laughs> so we, we definitely want to have that experience for students. And that's why we believe that the intersection between academic institutions like Greensboro 
employers like Cone and, and, and workforce entities like MedCerts is so very important because that intersection allows for the learner to have the experience, to have the job potential outcomes, and ultimately learn how to be a really strong practitioner in that environment, which we believe will actually help drive not only them taking the role, being successful at it, but also growing their career long term. Raphael, and can you also talk about what does the normal student profile uh, of a med certs, um, you know, student look like? I know it can be different because there's a plethora of programs, but but in general, it may be helpful for those that are kind of thinking about this to to get a sense of that. Yeah, we <clears throat> excuse me. We work with students from from a variety of different backgrounds, and and we actually feel like that's a strength. Um, recognizing that and, and really putting resources and, and focus behind it. I loved how Michelle said intentionality. It's certainly what we're doing here. The first thing is our price points are designed to work with students who perhaps are coming through an American Job Center and they have a WIOA voucher and that voucher has a certain threshold. They will most likely, can't say every time, but most likely that voucher is more than adequate to pay for the entirety of our program. That includes all of the tech, the, the actual uh, training, but it also includes wraparound services, which we know are so very important today. So student success or student advising, career services if necessary, um, a loaner laptop with software packages loaded on it to take to, to be mindful of the digital divide. Um, making sure that a student has interventions as they go through their program to ensure success. But when you think about those students coming from an American Job Center, they're coming from the military, they're the spouse of somebody who's in the military, or they're finding us on their own, the vast majority of our students um, identify as female, which we believe is right in line with the industry. It's a very nurturing environment. It's something where people truly care about others, and they're looking to make a difference. So our students are coming from a diverse background. Uh, we believe that's a strength. We want to continue to do that. We have them from all corners of the country, including D.C. and the Virgin Islands. So we're very, very excited to continue to offer an affordable, uh, really clear pathway uh, towards success and ultimately maybe even, you know, continuing their academic journey. But we want to make sure that we remember our true north. And we, we started working with students that come through American job centers and through the military. And, and we're going to continue to do that because we're very proud of it. Thank you, Raphael. Um, I do want to highlight that uh, every single one uh, of the MedCERTs programs that are offered in this partnership with Greensboro College have been approved through the work of Suzanne Siddharth with Guilford Works. Uh, so individuals that would be interested uh, and could qualify for workforce development funding uh, would have the opportunity to see uh, what potential support they could have uh, which would then allow them to uh, access, to Dr. Zarda's point, from an equitable lens, uh, a MedSearch uh, online healthcare training program, uh, earn that certification, and then immediately uh, begin working uh, at Cone Health. And so, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, they are there, uh, and I know that uh, the team will certainly post follow-up information on to where you can find that information, but uh, Suzanne and the team have been uh, very diligent to ensure that that process has been done. Uh, and that's an important step to Raphael's point uh, about that. Um, Michelle, I want to come back to you, particularly around uh, this, this challenge from a workforce perspective, um, because obviously, uh, as you referenced, um, you know, every, every month there's potential that there are, you know, 50, 100 or more uh, positions in specific areas. Um, obviously, you highlighted certified medical assistant um, and I believe I also heard at one point, maybe pharmacy technician, uh, potentially. Can you talk a little bit about some of the other positions in the allied health space that uh, you would specifically want to share that, you know, oftentimes are positions that are, are pretty regularly available, uh, yet play not only just such a critical function in our healthcare system, not just at Cone, but across the nation, but also are, are oftentimes positions that lead into other exciting uh, what I call a journey of a healthcare career. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so um, there's so many, um, whether it's in the non-clinical allied health or in the, the nursing space, but um, the patient care technicians um, are critical for us. The um, sterile processing techs, the physical therapy techs, the pharmacy techs, um, IT from a healthcare standpoint, IT technicians, um, you know, again, the list goes on and on, right, as it relates to those roles. 
ultimately, again, you know, we, we're really open to individuals, you know, coming into our organization into the non-clinical space and finding ways through our career paths through to the allied space or to the nursing space, right? We wanna create that environment where again, it's continuous learning, um, continuous opportunity for individuals to upskill. Again, as you're aware, healthcare is a ever changing industry. And so again, we are always, um, as we look at our strategic workforce plans, we're always looking on the horizon to understand what are the needs of our communities for the future. And so as roles, um, you know, truly come to end of life, um, we want to be able to upskill that, those individuals to take on new and exciting opportunities um, across our, our enterprise. So again, there are so many roles within the, the healthcare industry that would be applicable for some of these individuals. Um, we are excited again um, for the opportunity to have at least these partners from a partnership standpoint to help build our pipeline. Great, thank you, Michelle. And I think it is important to just highlight for, for our audience that um, the programs that are offered are not just clinical uh, in nature. There are some that are, would be considered more of the non-clinical, um, you know, for example, healthcare administration, um, you know, health unit coordinator, uh, not necessarily clinical positions. Um, as well as there's some additional even in the healthcare IT uh, space as well. So while the majority uh, are clinical, uh, there are still some non-clinical options that, that to Rafael's earlier point, you know, we see a lot of people who uh, have been in the healthcare space or have been in another industry that have a college degree, but are looking for that opportunity to get a certification and get back into what could be a new field. And, and to Rafael's point, we're seeing more and more of that actually uh, among the population of women. Um, who certainly have been impacted more uh, disproportionately at, during this pandemic uh, compared to others. And, and I'm sure, you know, as Michelle noted, uh, Cone is being very thoughtful around how you appropriately uh, handle that from a cultural perspective when people have daycare and, and different things like that. So really important. Um, Raphael, I want you to, if you don't mind, to speak about, uh, particularly at a national level, um, how, you know, they're, they're, this continued focus is leading to more and more uh, grant opportunities that, um, in partnership, uh, as we're referencing here, pre present opportunities to the region to potentially ascertain additional funding to solve some of this, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, it, it's a great question. And I, I think in my 20 plus years of experience, I've never seen a uh, an, an environment or landscape where this is really poised to have, it's, it's almost a little spooky, candidly, where government healthcare employers, co colleges and universities and training providers or other workforce entities um, are, are aligned. And, and it really is a uh, uh, kind of a, a neat moment in time if you take away the, the some of the, the crisis and, and, and challenges that we're seeing on side of it, because it feels like you can actually make a difference. So as we look at grant or funding opportunities, um, consortiums are actually the strongest opportunity. Now, I'm not a grant expert. I have a whole team that's far more, you know, adept at this than I am, but being able to look for things like uh, ARPA grant funding, um, you know, Title III, Title V, private funding, things like this are, are it, the, the, the landscape is, is definitely um, just fraught with, with opportunity. And so when we look at this, a lot of what are being required in those is med certs can't do it alone and a college can't do it alone per se, or a, a, a healthcare system can't do it alone. So we really approach the partnership position again, where if you're bringing a consortia of, of like-minded groups together like this one, the likelihood that you're going to be able to submit a very strong proposal to say, not only do we have the training programs that are in demand, you know, and I can pull you a burning glass or I forget what they're called today, but like a burning glass report and show you these are the in-demand occupations in this specific geography. You can bring a college who has that academic um, uh, pedigree, has the history, has the, uh, the, uh, the accreditation components. And then you also bring an employer to the table. You're seeing a very strong position in that space. So there are truly hundreds of millions, possibly billions of dollars in funding available for those entities out there that are interested in pursuing it. And I think it's really important that those types of opportunities be sourced and vetted. And that's something that we believe is important to bring to a, a partnership to say, you know, 
is there a way to also procure some governmental funding outside of say like WIOA or SNAP or TANF because those are more evergreen, um, you know, something that's a little bit more, uh, you know, one-time funding that maybe Congress has authorized or, you know, the, the White House has authorized or the Department of Education, Department of Labor has authorized. These are very important opportunities to go pursue. And the more partners that you have doing this and can, can clearly paint that pathway for the learner from again, K to job, and you have these, these partners in place, you create a very strong position to be able to secure that funding. Um, you know, if, if, you, if you track some of this stuff, um, you know that there are a ton of these things. So the best advice I can give everybody is have an expert, just like you would on the clinical healthcare side, who can sift through the detritus, find the right ones, and surface those to the partnership consortia so that they, those can be evaluated. And I believe that those should be part of the approach that you bring, because in that way, you're also taking advantage of funding that's been earmarked specifically for this purpose. It's not going to go towards something else. So if we don't use it and, and, and use it for the benefit of these learners, ultimately, who become employees and future, you know, continual learners, I think that that's a bit of a miss. So the landscape is very, very positive. Again, you know, you, you have to have all of these partners creating the legs to the stool or the chair, whatever metaphor we want to use, they're all part of this solution. And I think that this is a great opportunity to kind of bring those things together because the opportunities do exist and there's many, and there's significant amounts of them at this point. That's what we're seeing. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Zarda, you know, I was reviewing some recent data that you had shared with me from the Guilford uh, County uh, or Guilford Works 2030 initiative. And you know, interestingly enough, uh, healthcare was number two uh, among the region in the number of employees, you know, just beat out by logistics, which we wouldn't be shocked by, uh, given that the, the capital. Um, but, you know, from the role that you serve, uh, obviously, I, I tell people all the time, Dr. Zarda probably serves on more boards than most college presidents because he cares very deeply about the region. Um, share with us how often these discussions uh, from a healthcare workforce perspective come up and, and you know, just just from that lens where you've also served on hospital boards, um, you know, where where you feel uh, other colleges can follow Greensboro College's lead um, and really thinking deeply about this type of issue. Um, Jeff, I would say that the uh, conversations are almost evergreen where they're ongoing in almost every sector. Now, in some cases, not specifically healthcare. Um, example is I happen to be the chairman of the North Carolina Folk Festival Board, and I just had a meeting this morning and we're going to pull off the festival in September, but we're having a hard time finding riggers and electricians and so on. So it's the workforce overall, but specifically, as you said, healthcare is number two in the region uh, to logistics. Um, I think it is a fair observation. I've been in higher education a long time now that for obvious and good reason, we think about degrees. We think about bachelor's degrees. We think about master's degrees. We think about doctor of nursing practice degrees. That's very important. I I'm not saying it's very important, but I think that higher education needs to sort of pivot a bit and realize that the short-term affordable certificates are indeed part of the access into the degree programs later on. It benefits the individual, as, as Raffaella has really highlighted. It benefits the employer, as Michelle has talked about. And as we develop the ethos, it will develop the higher ed institutions as well, because some of these will become students. But we are, we are trained in higher education to think about the credential. That's what we do. We are a credentialing institution. We all are. Um, we have some fantastic uh, institutions in our region. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the healthcare components at University of North Carolina Greensboro, at North Carolina a t at uh, Winston-Salem State, at High Point, at Elon, at Wake Forest, my goodness, it's a, you know, that's a powerful list of institutions. But I hope more follow our lead in saying, you have to do what they're doing. They're doing it great. And Salem College has taken a unique position on women in healthcare, but get people in the workforce, three months, six months, eight months, get people in the workforce. Uh, it's online. They can do it from wherever they are. Uh, it's affordable as compared to a four-year degree. And again, as we've already said, we're being a bit redundant. Once you get someone into the healthcare industry, who knows where they end up? Perfect. I want to just call attention to our audience. Uh, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate uh, in the Q&A to post them. Um, I want to just take a pause and just see if there are any questions. If not, 
Um, I'm going to, uh, you know, ask each of our panelists uh, to just share some some closing thoughts, um, because I, I think, uh, at least from my vantage point, we have certainly covered uh, this this uh, in depth. Um, but I want to obviously uh, just double check if there are any closing questions. Okay, I am not seeing any, but that does not mean if I see any pop up while we have our, our panelists do some closing thoughts, I will I will step in once they finish their thought to get that question answered. I'm going to send it over, um, Raphael, to you, if you don't mind, just to uh, provide some closing thoughts. Um, yeah, thank you. So first of all, thank you again for the, the opportunity to speak today. You know, we're we're excited about you know continuing this work um we're we're grateful that we get the opportunity to be part of a solution that that's pretty rare and so i i'm very grateful for that and i know that my team at, at medserts and larger medserts is, is uh, appreciative of that as well so thank you um you know the, the number one takeaway for me the thing that sticks out in my mind is when you have you know a shift in the landscape and you have people um like michelle and dr sarda who are who are thinking of this as thought leaders you know, if you rewind five or six years ago when we tried to do something similar, like that, it was a bit of a non-starter. Um, so I guess a, a global pandemic certainly does have a level of impact, but I don't think that that's the only thing that was in play here, is that there are other like-minded individuals who know that this is a problem, who are looking for those real solutions. And for me, it's always great because I can tell you what I think, but again, that's not going to be the same or as powerful as having these two individuals say something similar or in many cases, much more eloquent than I can. So uh, that's the big takeaway for me is listen to the experts. Um, you know, if, if partnerships is something that that is a, a great solution, this is a wonderful model to follow. Um, and, and I think that the work that's being done here is absolutely spot on. So thanks again for the time and the opportunity to participate. Great. Thank you, Raphael. Michelle. Yes, well, first and foremost, again, thank you so much for having me here today to just uh, be a part of this important um, discussion. Um, you know, my takeaway uh, from where I sit is I see um, our ability to have the staffing needed to meet the needs of our community as a healthcare utility. That means, you know, we've got to find ways through what I call disruptive collaborations and partnerships. Uh, to be able to um, take this on the offense and not content consistently be on the defense. And so I'm excited around some of these partnerships and these opportunities that um, presents Cone Health with the opportunity to know that we're not in this alone, but we truly are in this together. And I really encourage um, my fellow colleagues um, that it truly is going to require us to be deliberate and intentional um, to base to make sure that we're moving the needle forward to meet the needs of our community. Great, Michelle. Before I go over to the president, I do want to. Uh, we did get a question um, that I think is actually a little bit of a mix, uh, really, for you, Raphael, as well as Michelle. So I'll give you the question, and I'll add a little on where Michelle can add. So the question is: Once an individual obtains a certification uh, and then an entry level position. Who assists with charting a path to career advancement? So, Rafael, why don't you start with that? Because I know there's portions of that that you can answer. And then I'd like to assume that they're going to go on to Cone and allow Michelle to speak about uh, what Cone would do in that circumstance. Yeah, we can definitely speak about it from a, you know, a, a, a training and then onward program in terms of promotion at a, at a career that would obviously be much more beneficial here from Michelle. So what we do is, again, we're intentional about it. We amplify to our 40,000 plus alumni, our 14,000 students currently in program, um, that these are opportunities before they actually enroll in the program. So we're very, very intentional about the fact that MedCert is a step along the journey. And all this information is available on our website. Our partnership ecosystem is there. The credit transfer tables are available for a learner to look at. So you will know exactly how many credits transfer to what program at what school. This is about transparency. It's about intentionality. And it's about making sure that the, the learner consumer or consumer learner, whatever we want to call them, is very much informed about what those opportunities are. And then they're the ones that can choose which direction that they go into. But at the end of the day, our primary goal is to get them certified to get them working and then they can continue when they're ready into the next step of their academic journey but we're very intentional and very transparent about it and our partners like that because they're starting to see students show up at their front door for either a job and or to continue their educational journey 
from my perspective, from an organizational standpoint, you know, once that individual has achieved that certification, there's a couple of things. Um, you know, I'm a true believer in a partnership between our employees and the organization. We've got a responsibility to develop our team members and our team members have to take some strong ownership around their development as well. So we here at Cone Health, we've got career ladders and um, clear um, pathways for individuals to navigate through the organization, if you will, within particular job families. Um, and so we also have a um, career um, navigating staff um, that basically can meet with our, um, our team members. We have internal mobility teams that can meet with individuals to talk with them about where they want to go next and what they want to do next. Within our pipeline programs, we also have opportunities that are readily available once individuals have achieved um, that accomplishment to be able to move them directly into that. We move from an internal mobility standpoint here at Cone Health, close to 60% of our team members on an annual basis, moving from um, role to role across the organization. So we are truly creating a, a, an environment where individuals can truly achieve their full potential. Um, if they are so willing to do so. So that is kind of the, the, the systems and structures that we have in place, whether they're speaking with our career navigators or internal mobility teams, they're constantly chatting with their leaders. We have what we call iCompass discussions on a quarterly basis where we're talking to our employees. What do you wanna do next? Where do you see yourself in five years? It truly is a team effort as it relates to how we move individuals through our workforce. But again, it has to be deliberate. It has to be intentional. And um, again, it's definitely a systems approach to getting that done. Great, thank you, Rafael and Michelle. Dr. Zarda. Uh, well, Jeffrey, I'd, I'd probably, uh, my closing remarks would be for all of us to recognize the criticality of the workforce issues in healthcare. Um, this last number of years has been an environment unlike I think any of us have ever seen in the workforce. Um, combination of the COVID-19 pandemic, the economy, and many other factors. Uh, but we could all agree it's disruptive. If you go to a restaurant and you have to wait for quite a while, then you get into the restaurant, a third of the uh, tables are empty, but they don't have the staff. Or perhaps they're now closed on Monday, but they're also now closed on Tuesday. It's disruptive for the North Carolina Folk Festival if we don't have the kind of proper support we have to have that artist do two uh, shows rather than one. Um, but in healthcare, think of the healthcare. If we, the healthcare workforce shortage is a matter of, in some cases, life or death, yeah. and is always a quality of life. Um, I go to my fair share of doctors and dentists and so on, and I've seen it, you know, up close and personal as a patient, where you know, not too many years ago, maybe they were struggling with the number of vacancies had they had, but now it's to the point where it's disrupting the practice. And I think we all need to recognize that the workforce challenge in healthcare is among the most important, if not the most important in our culture. Uh, and the last thing I would say is just an example of what we will continue to do at Greensboro College. We're not gonna stop doing what we're doing. We've added something new. Uh, we just found out uh, within the past few weeks that a student who came here in uh, 2013, uh, single mother, uh, they struggled to get her into college, but they were able to do it. They figured it out. And she became a very solid student, captain of our swim team, president of the Student Government Association, and so on. Well, she has just graduated from the Uniform Services uh, University for Health Sciences in Bethesda, Maryland, where they train uh, healthcare uh, folks for the military. And so she is now, your name is Maddie, I'll leave your last name out, but she is now U.S. Army Second Lieutenant Dr. Maddie, last name. Wonderful story. Took her nine years. It took her nine years to get there. And that's a wonderful story. I love to tell it. Uh, and I know her pretty well. But what if that same single mother and daughter, if she couldn't figure out the finances to get into Greensboro College? You know, maybe, maybe, you know, she gets the med tech certificate, she gets employed by Cone Health, and maybe she becomes a doctor in nine years. And again, we will not change the core of what the college does. This is a new initiative. And I really do hope and, and really do expect all educational institutions to move in this direction. That the quality of life in our culture and our country is dependent on having a trained workforce and we're not there today. Thank you, Dr. Zarda, and thank you for, for sharing, you know, such a powerful uh, story, but also testament to what Greensboro College 
uh, does for its students and, and obviously the, the benefit to industry. Um, I do wanna acknowledge that we did have uh, one last, not a question, but a statement um, that is important for me to share. And that is that um, the National Health Career Association also provides career resources, continuing education and advanced training to uh, certification holders, along with partnering with employers to help develop career ladders. And so that is uh, an, an addendum to the, uh, the uh, answer that uh, Raphael and, and Michelle had provided uh, that I wanted to make sure that I shared. And I do want to also, uh, again, thank our panelists uh, for their time, uh, for them sharing or for them sharing with us their thought leadership uh, and their passion uh, for being a part, part of the solution. Um, and I do want to also thank Greensboro College, not only uh, under Dr. Zarda's leadership, um, but as well as the faculty, um, because when you make decisions like this, it is a change. Um, but this is a change for the better. And the faculty have been wonderful um, in recognizing this need for the support of the industry and obviously would not happen without the leadership of Dr. Zarda. And then finally, um, I do want to call attention to those who are interested in learning more. Um, I will read it out loud. Uh, you just want to go to http uh, slash slash innovation and workforce development dot greensboro dot edu and you can learn more there. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to connect with Suzanne and Joe uh, via that link. We'll obviously share that out as well. But again, innovation and workforce development dot greensboro dot edu is where you can find additional information on these programs and opportunities to take the next step in your healthcare career. Again, thank you to each and every one of our panelists, Michelle, Raphael, and Dr. Zarda for your time. And again, our appreciation to the entire team for putting this together. Everyone have a wonderful afternoon.